Great. Uh, thanks so much, Senator uh, Lieberman. Um, we'll now move uh, back to the regularly scheduled program with a, another small modification. Uh, we'll, we'll be going in now to uh, the startup panel where um, four very interesting companies that are already either in uh, doing business in the U.S. or, or uh, on their way to will be discussing with Adam some of the challenges that they face and the strategies for overcoming them. Um, also, uh, Justin Rubin, who's an associate uh, of Senator Lieberman, uh, a um, special counsel at Senator Lieberman's uh, law firm, will, has agreed to sit in on the, the panel and, and provide some uh, U.S. perspective on that. So with that, let me uh, call up our panelists. Uh, Shane Cohen, uh, VP Marketing and Sales of Uvision. Uh, Avshalom Ehrlich, of, uh, the founder and CTO of uh, Smart Shooter. Thanks a lot. Hi. Uh, Gil Limonchi, co-founder of Amentrine. And Asaf Miller, co-founder of Polaris. And Justin, you... Oh, okay. I thought I'd, I saw you leaving. Right, thank you. Let's say goodbye. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, Gideon, we have uh, 40 minutes. Is that right? Something like this. Just yell at me when we've had enough. Okay. Uh, okay, so we'll start off by giving you each just a couple of minutes to talk about the company and yourselves, and then I'll move on to a, a series of canned questions that I've got. If it, if it strikes you and you think you want to add something, feel free to do so, and if not, let it pass by, no problem. And uh, we'll give you a chance to talk about uh, how to do business in and with the United States government, which uh, clearly is a, is a real challenge for especially a littler, littler uh, company. So uh, please, you vision to kick us off, Jane. Okay. Uh Good afternoon, my name is Shane Cohen. I was uh, 25 years in Israeli artillery. As an all ex-military went to work in the military industry, started off with Sultan Systems, the big companies, Albert Systems. And in the last past two years, I've uh, moved over and started off again uh, with a small, you can call it a startup uh, when you compare to the big companies, uh, Uvision. Um, Uvision at the beginning, uh, I think, listened to the senator's advice and we started off with a product that wasn't competing with any of the big industries. We make only one product. We have a family of them, but we make only one product, which is a loitering munition, or in a layman's term, a suicide drone or kamikaze drone. And uh, that's what we do. And uh, in the past two years as well, we've had uh, quite a big success uh, in the uh, American market with CITSO, and we can speak about that later, how we started off there. Thank you. Sure. Hi. Jeff, you're on. It's okay. Well, my name is uh, Shalom Erlich. I uh, started as a software engineer in a small startup, then continued to Rafael for eight wonderful years, then went out back to the startup uh, world. And after a few years, uh, including serving for a better place, uh, me and my partner, Michal, uh, decided to open our own uh, startup. Actually, we had a few ideas, and one of them was civilian, and the other was uh, military or in, de in the defense. And we both uh, selected a defense uh, project, which is much more meaningful for us. And we established a smart uh, shooter. One of the first uh, partner was uh, Abraham Azor from uh, Rafael, many, many years in Rafael. And uh, we established a smart shooter in order to increase the lethality of uh, the soldier and uh, its survivability by enabling that uh, each shot will hit the target with uh, no uh, misses which means no collateral uh, damage. Uh, the system is really sophisticated, mainly computer vision and electro-optical uh, technologies. Uh, we have a great, uh, great team, 40 people seated in Yagur. Uh, the company is uh, private held it, uh, even today. Um. 
my name is Gilly Monchik. I always start by saying that I've got an accent, but don't worry, I'm not French, usually because I work in the States. Uh, I was born in Brooklyn, New York, but I grew up in Israel, and 26 years ago I served in Israeli Special Forces. And at that point of time, uh, I realized that uh, technology is a tremendous force multiplier. Uh, I left the service, and I moved back to the States. And I worked for a company that, when I started, uh, was tiny, $20 million in losing business. It was called Raycal or Talis. Uh, and we won a program with the U.S. Special Operation Command to develop the multiband inter intra team radio. It was the first software-defined handheld radio that was developed between 1997 to 2000. Uh, that was an amazing radio, and it's a great story about focus. So uh, up until that point of time, Raycal, which was a $2 billion defense company, had a proxy company in the States, in Rockville. And that company tried to be a peddler. So if you have a million different products, radars, receivers, and you're trying to push them all, it's the shotgun method. And nothing happened for 20 years. Uh, at a certain point, my CEO at that point of time says, let's focus. Let's be world leaders in handheld, secure, type 1 encrypted, software-defined handheld radios. When everybody was doing man packs, we focused on a handheld. And that turned the company overnight from $20 million in losing business to selling 250,000 radios, which every radio is around 10K. So it's billions of dollars based on one product. Now, the first adapters were SOCOM, the U.S. Special Operation Command, and they pushed it out into the Army, Marines, and I was in charge internationally and in all the NATO countries and the Five Eyes, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and UK. Uh, so for more than 20 years, I've been working C4ISR with the SOCOM, Five Eyes, NATO, and Israeli SOF. Uh, then I started a company called Silinx, which developed hearing protection, hearing enhancement headset systems. And there are Israeli uh, origins for that company. Uh, there was an Israeli company, but we opened the company. We turned the company from uh, uh, to be the parent company and worked very closely with, with the special forces, and that became a program of record. And a few years ago, I came over every once in a while, I come over to Israel and I meet with some friends in the special forces, some senior guys. And a friend of mine three and a half years ago told me, Gil, I work closely with the guys back in the States, but please go back and share knowledge and tell them that every time we try to operate clandestine and leave Israel in different ways, helicopters and vehicles, the Russians, the Iranians, and Hezbollah know. So the Russians, Iranians, and Hezbollah know. That was three and a half years ago. And he told me, Gil, tell your friends to get a spectrum analyzer from Rota Schwartz, buy a DJI drone with a FLIR camera, and tell them to try to infiltrate. One force will mimic the enemy, another force will mimic the force that is trying to penetrate, and good luck. So in the States for 16 years, we've been fighting a vicious enemy, but we've been fighting cavemen. And a new generation of operators and commanders was brought up on fighting cavemen, vicious wars, but not near peer. And we kind of fell asleep, the same way that Israel fell asleep in Lebanon with Hezbollah initially. Uh, so we fell asleep and we forgot that they're near peer guys. So this is a big opportunity. So three and a half years ago, he told me we can be detected when we push to talk a radio. We could be seen by thermal night vision devices. And he spoke to me about a small company, a tiny company from a kibbutz that uh, is developing cloaking technology, multi-spectral cloaking technologies that can make them disappear. And I heard that, and I said, you know, that's amazing, and he's, for me, that's the due diligence. And I started the crusade uh, in the States, touching all the special forces in the community, mentioning uh, the threats, and later on we can expand uh, about that. But uh, we recently uh, got a contract with the U.S. Special Operation Command, and we're working with, with CTTSO, and happy to expand to that. Let's give yourself a chance to... I don't have Gil's accent, so please excuse my rusty English. Uh, my name is Asaf Miller, and I'm one of the co-founders of uh, Polaris Solutions. Polaris expertise is uh, battlefield survivability, focusing on uh, signature management and tactical textile. Um, my partner, another Asaf, and I served together in a soft unit called Maglan. Our trigger to establish Polaris was the Second Lebanon War. Um, 
my partner was a signature management um, professional officer and I was a company commander. It was the first time um, we operated in a war situation. Um, during our missions, we realized that we and the other units around us didn't have, didn't have the relevant gear or signature management gear, if any at all. After the war, uh, we decided we wanted to make a difference and uh, try to fill in the gap. Um, we started Polaris eight years ago in my parents' garage, experimenting with new materials um, and dreaming of redefining the way our army uh, confronts its signature management challenges. We invented a unique material called TVC. This is TVC, right? Uh, which enables reshapeable and uh, multispectral concealment. Uh, from this material, we manufacture um, variety, via, a variety of uh, products from sensor covers to snipers, team, recon teams, and vehicles. We also came up with a um, um, new paradigm, paradigm um, um, regarding signature management called the 300 concept. We changed the way we carry our signature management gear um, and brought up our survivability along the mission. Nowadays, Polaris has uh, 16 employees and two main brands, Rajuga for signature management and also gear for tactical, tactical textile. Uh, we operate mainly in Israel and in the US with our US partner, Tier Tactical. Our products help soldiers here and around the world get closer to their enemy without being detected. I'll take this opportunity to wish the, all the new startups uh, good luck and the, for, my, for our experience, the, the way from the journey from an idea to a, a selling product is long, but it's worthwhile. Justin Rubin, I will be quick because the Senator already talked. I work with former Senator Lieberman, and um, we've, um, I myself spent six years working for the Army and looking at what the Army wanted to be when I grew up and looking at these situations. And um, what the Senator and I do is we help companies, both U.S. and Israeli, navigate the government, work with both Congress and DOD, and build relationships and understand how things work. And we came to Israel for the first time two years ago looking at this, because as the Senator had said, I had worked for the Army, and we'd seen the underfunding of modernization. And we saw such a great opportunity working with Israeli companies, and seeing these companies up here, seeing the exhibits out there, we were excited for the opportunity to help bring solutions to the U.S. and to help promote the Israeli brand and do work here. Thanks, guys. Uh, starting up a company in any space is very difficult. Starting it up in a defense or national security space uh, is extremely competitive. And uh, being an Israeli company with the biggest market in the U.S. adds another layer to that. How do you overcome the challenges? What did you find were the most interesting things that you needed to, to accomplish in order to uh, be able to sell in the U.S.? Shane? I never started a company, so I think the guy who got the most clap, clapping of the hands uh, deserves the, to give the first answer. Okay, because, uh, go ahead. So, um, I think the um, one thing we need to understand that we, we had, we, 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 thought we, we thought we understand our challenge, but the challenge in, in the States is, is different operational-wise. So, you need a local company that speaks the user's um, language, not just English. And uh, transparent the, uh, the and take your product and um, make the, the changes that the end users in the U.S. will want to embrace. So it's not it's not copy paste. You need to um, um, adjust yourself. So they were really product development challenges, not policy or uh, other constrictions. So you wanted to tailor your product better for their customer. You didn't have to. You didn't have to overcome regulatory concerns or policy or things like that. It was really targeting your product to the customer needs. Exactly. Okay. I'm sure. Well, we started a few times to enter the U.S. and we found it very, very difficult for a small company. Uh, first, we thought that uh, participating in a few shows and uh, showing our uh, product is enough. Soon, uh, soon enough, we heard it from many direction that that's not the right way, that we must have a presence in the U.S. 
uh, it can be our company or a strategic partner or something like that. We are still not there. We are still uh, looking for the right uh, way and uh, the right uh, partner. Uh, last uh, last week, we no, actually last last month, we had a really great uh, demonstration to the CTTSO with the IAI and ELTA. Uh, it was an uh, anti, anti-drone solution and it works uh, really well, so maybe that will be one of the ways uh, to start, but uh, we found it uh, really difficult. Uh, so a few of you have mentioned partnerships. Uh, Gil, it can be a little scary for a small company to partner with a large defense contractor, regardless if it's a, an Israeli or an American company. you have any advice for some of these guys who are thinking about, the, about doing so? Uh, first of all, I think they need to find smaller companies to work with. I think the big companies are initially very hard to work with and the sale into a big company, there is the non-invented here syndrome and it's a complex sale. So I would try and find a, a smaller company that has got presence with the US Special Forces, works with the first adapters. And I wanted to give some tips to the, to the guys here. Uh, I know many Israeli companies for many, many years and the US has been an untapped market for them. Uh, they always fear. They are always afraid from the states. Many Israeli companies are also used to the US DOD prior to 9-11. Prior to 9-11, if you were not part of a program of record, even if you had the best things in sliced bread, you could not penetrate. But after 9-11, everything changed. And even if you won program of records and you had a better product, even if it was 60 or 70 percent here today, you could, you could penetrate. So I'd like to talk uh, about a strategy, strategy to, to help Israeli companies and startups. So first of all, I recommend reading a book called Purple Cow. It, it's translated to Hebrew, it's called Paras Gula. And Purple Cow, the author, is a marketing guru. His name is Seth Goodin. He lives in Manhattan. And one summer, he travels to the countryside, and he suddenly he sees a cow. And somebody who lives in Manhattan or Tel Aviv suddenly sees a cow. He says, wow. And then he sees another cow, and he says, wow. But after three cows, there's no wow factor. And suddenly he sees a purple cow and he says, wow. So a purple cow is an analogy to a remarkable product. So first of all, in our day and age, there are many cows, regular cows, and you ignore ads, you ignore commercials. And the only way is really to, so a purple cow represents a, a wow thing, a remarkable product or remarkable service. An example for a remarkable product is the iPod that Apple did. So everything about the man-machine interface, uh, the packaging, both quite comfort headsets that came out in a nice case with courtesy cards inside. So first of all, Israeli companies need to create a purple cow to understand that they need to be snipers. They need to focus with one unique, remarkable product. And some companies have got, uh, like Smart Shooter, for example, they're very, very unique companies. And once you've got this purple cow, it needs to be everything. You need to create a brand. You need to Americanize the product. You need to have a US, US presence. And you need to work bottom up the special forces and from top to below. And the special forces are the guys that can make things happen and push it later on into the majority and the special forces. So I believe, first of all, not using the, the shotgun method, focusing and what Leonard Cohen, the singer, once used to say, first you take Manhattan, then you take Berlin. So Israeli companies first focus on Manhattan. After you take Manhattan, believe me, all the rest of NATO will fall through the five eyes. So focus US only and only US because you've got limited resources. And the upside you get in working with the US is a hundred or a thousand times more than what you work with Poland or with Germany or UK. So start with the US. Focus there, everything else will fall into order after that. Well, that'll, that'll help me segue because cash flow is, uh, is a struggle for uh, every startup, really. Uh, how do companies in Israel go about securing seed funding and growth funding? Can you give some advice, uh, maybe Shane or Justin, some of the things that you do to help that process? Again, you've given me an easy question because my answer for, uh, for my company is that we've got a, we're privately owned, so we didn't have to go. 
go out and uh, look for, for investment. But when we went into the US market, uh, as Gail was saying before, uh, in order to, to penetrate and to get uh, into organizations such as uh, CITSO um, and receive their funding, um, uh, we first went to the end users, showed them the, the uniqueness of our product, and uh, when we showed them and that we're also putting in our own money, it relatively uh, was easy from then on. I'm going to generally defer to the startups on how they raise their money. I will give the, you the do not, because I saw it happen with one company, and I um, was talking to a company on Friday that was considering it because they were desperate. Be careful when you're using money from Asian countries and you don't know where it came from fully. China can be linked to companies no matter where they came from, and linked to money no matter where it came from. And um, I saw companies that did not think they were taking Chinese money, but they did not do their due diligence, and their questions raised. And what I would say is, know where your money came from. Be very careful about that, because your competitors will know where it came from, and they will use it against you, and it can be a problem. And so, make sure your money is clearly where it came from, and you're confident when it gets looked at. I listened to the panel of the investor that uh, was uh, here before, and actually I find it really sad because most of them, what they said that uh, they will, there is not enough money in the uh, defense industry, and I'm not talking about uh, cyber, which is a different uh, story. Uh, everybody talked about dual use, so if you have a civilian uh, uh, civilian product, it's, it's can be can be okay, but then there is the paradox that you cannot uh, be focused on military and civilian market uh, at, at the same time. So it's really really difficult. So I found that most of VCs will not invest in defense uh, companies, and there are very very few that uh, will do that. And you probably need to be very unique and with extraordinary terms in order to take uh, this as a part. So our solution was to work clo very closely to Mafat and Sibat uh, and private, uh, private investors that uh, sees something that is more value than just uh, finan financial and they believed in us. Uh, most private investor does not understand, do not understand the defense market uh, they do not understand the, the limitations and the, the export controls and all, all of this uh, stuff. But if you are doing that uh, because you believe that you are giving value to the country, then uh, it can be combined. I believe that there is money in the defense uh, industry, but it takes much more time than in civilian markets. Because the time to market is so long for our kind of products, um, I suggest the startup companies will be will try to be as thin as it can for starts for the first uh, few years and very efficient and don't take money if you don't have to. Um, this is the best advice. To taking money is easy, getting it back it's more complex. I want to elaborate a little bit. I totally agree. The first year that uh, we used our own money, and when it ended, we used the friends and family, and only then we uh, f uh, raised uh, more money. But on the other hand, uh, you must be very careful to take uh, seed money that is not enough to bring you to the next uh, level. Then you got stuck without a functional product, you cannot go to the market, and you need more money. So it's very challenging. You need to be from day one to know that it's going to take a very long time. And you need that uh, time and you need enough money to go through all this way in order to have uh, your sales and uh, start uh, <laughs> living normally. If, if you manage to create by yourself a little bit of traction with the US Special Forces, I found it that if you would go to the venture capital firms, and you will give them a little bit of information on who in the Special Forces is using and sometimes even get like a thumbs up from the Special Forces. It makes it easier to get uh, an investment. 
So you've each overcome some hurdles just to get here, and there's an audience full, and then upstairs full of uh, companies that want to be in your shoes. Do you have some advice that you'd like to share, something you wish somebody told you when you were first starting out, make their lives easier? Yeah, I do. Shane, you're killing me. Yeah, no. <laughs> that's, that's what we do, suicide. <laughs> it's a good thing you got a hell of a product. Yeah. First of all, I think it's very difficult to give uh, advices because each uh, startup is very unique and the way is uh, unique. It depends on the people and what you know and how much money you have and the product and in many other uh, uh, factors. Uh, the question that uh, have been asked in, from few others is where and when to approach the big companies because they, are, they can complete you, they have the facilities uh, and the uh, resources to market your product, to build it, uh, to do everything. It sounds wonderful. And I think that uh, the one advice that uh, should be is that go there only when you have uh, enough value uh, to bring them. When you have already prototype, proof of concept, a uh, few clients, whatever. If you are going only with the idea, it's, I believe it's not going to happen. I would be a little bit extreme in my words right now. So first of all, it's really being a sniper. Forget the shotgun method. Shotgun doesn't work when you try and raid a hill and you shoot all over. Unless you stop and shoot, you don't hit. So always keep in mind that anything you do, focus really on one thing or two things. Do not do the shotgun method. It doesn't work. Do not touch the U.S. Army uh, with a stick even. First, try work SOCOM. So don't spend time on U.S. Air Force, U.S. Marines, U.S. Army, because they will drain all your resources, not because they're, it's just procedure. And once you win the U.S. Special Operation Command, once you get USASAC, the U.S. Army Special Operation Command, the Army will follow through. So if you look in the history of things that were adapted by SOCOM, they pushed into the big Army. So for small startup companies, touching the big defense companies, the, sorry, the big services is, is a drainer and ch the chances are that you won't see anything unless you win SOCOM. And I also warn you from big companies, I don't want to offend any big companies, big companies uh, are good for your exit. So after you get a few tens of millions of dollars with SOCOM, then approach the big companies that will buy you for 100 million or more. Before that, don't waste your time with the big companies. Another approach regarding the, the big companies or the other companies, I think for a small company, um, you must cooperate with other companies and, and try to sell your product as an add-on to, to their product and use their marketing efforts because as a small company you need to focus on the market that you can do by yourself and you, don't, you, don't, you are not able to go to the rest of the world and there you can use the bigger company. Yes. Same thing. Same concept. Um, don't go to big companies. Quit early. They're going to take your IP and they're going to be difficult to work with. You can find small partners to work with. Great. Protect your IP. Know the market. Know who your competitors are. And don't pick somewhere you, someone's already there. You know, don't, don't get, you know, if someone's there, you're going to have a lot, a lot much harder time in the U.S. Also, over, don't overpromise. Don't let the market get ahead of you, so don't be too slow market, but don't overpromise. People often get ahead and then it hurts at the later date. And finally, a lot of this is relationships, as people have seen. You can't just put a toe in the water. You know, you've got money limitations, but you're, all, you're not going to come out hire a big guy to help you. But find people with the relationships to help you through the process. You've got to commit to the market. You can't just sit down and say, well, I'm going to make a phone call or two. It takes an effort. So build the relationships, get people to help you with the relationships, and get in there. Always, always fight for the end users. If the enders, end users know that you're fighting for them and you're bending over in every way possible, even if you screw up. And I'll give you a short story how important it is. I was delivering to the U.S. Special Operation Command headset systems, and very expensive, $3,500 headset systems. And we provided 5,000 uh, cable sets, very expensive cable sets, $600 a piece. And I found out that there was a glitch in one of the cables with the microprocessor. 
So I fought my shareholders and I told the share, this was still in the warehouses, so it was not delivered yet. So I told my shareholders and fought like crazy and I told them, guys, you're going to build all the 5,000 cables now on our own money. And after they're all built and ready in boxes, we will go to Socom and says we screwed up and here are the cables. And that's what we did. We went, we built all the cables, I went to Socom and Socom said, Gil, thank you very much. And they bought all those cables. So I didn't have, so all the 5,000 cables, we didn't have and pay for them, so said so, and then we got a lot more sales because you're honest. So if you fight, and it's a small community, if the guys know that you're fighting for them, they will, they will make you succeed. They will always make you succeed. So that's one of the best recommendations I can give. Thank you. Uh, I, I appreciate all the answers and all the advice that you have for the startups uh, that are coming behind you. Uh, please, if you can, stick around so they can grab you on breaks or afterward to, to learn more that they didn't, wanna, it didn't get a chance to ask now. Uh, thank you very much to the panelists again, and uh, turn it back over to Gideon. Hey, hey, Adam, thank you very much for all the work you guys. Uh, I wanted uh, one, one more word, so... <laughs> yeah, I know. So, we are here, we, we really... Churchill used to say, we, sl we sleep s safely at night because rough men are ready to visit violence on those who may harm us. So we all in, in, in the States, in DC, here in Tel Aviv, there are people here wearing uniforms and people here from the armed service that day and night sacrifice uh, so we can have a great life. And uh, I appreciate that and thank you for all the effort you do for the war fighter.